<laughs> okay, sure. So hello and welcome everyone to yet another Be Waste Wise webinar of the month. As uh, most of you all know that I'm Akanksha Singh. I'm the community builder at Be Waste Wise. And this webinar of the month will be uh, focusing on uh, how to fully embrace the potential of refill as a circular business model. As you all know that we have been organizing such waste dialogues on a monthly basis, addressing the need for uh, knowledge dissemination on waste management uh, since 2013. We are a non-profit organization. We have been bridging this uh, waste solution expertise gap worldwide over a decade now. And uh, we have more than 12 moderators and one of them as uh, Emma right now is uh, hosting this one. Uh, we come, they're coming from different parts of the world and society and they're posing questions and teasing out insights and guiding conversations such as these, which are more relevant to us than those in any other online and offline platform. Uh, we have more than 300 contributors as well who are taking part in this journey. Uh, if you see the value in making the, such diverse sustainability dialogues uh, available uh, free of charge to anyone and everyone, then we request you all to please support us in our mission. Uh, we will be sharing the donation uh, link uh, uh, pay for the, 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 the donation link page uh, over the chat as well. We encourage you all to please do check out our website and donate. So moving on to the discussion today, we have today Emma, who will be hosting or moderating and being an instrumental in guiding this conversation, uh, uh, which is uh, related to refill and uh, reuse. Emma is one of the UK's leading specialists on the circular economy and sustainability in business. She has worked directly with businesses on sustainability for more than 25 years now and founded Lighthouse Sustainability in 2020 to deliver impact uh, impactful advice, coaching, and training. Emma assists uh, boards and senior management teams to navigate the complex world of sustainability from the SDGs and B Corp through carbon and net zero to materials and circular business models. Today, Emma, along with the esteemed panel, uh, will explore how refills are uh, key for a wide range of sectors, which include retail, home, uh, home goods, and hospitality. Uh, we will also discuss uh, what we've learned from the pilots uh, till date, what is a good practice, how we can maximize the outcomes from this type of work, what prod products are best for refill and have the highest impacts on waste and carbon. Uh, we have on this panel, Catherine Conway from, uh, from Go Unpackaged from UK and Lokesh Sambhavani from Refill in India who will also be sharing some latest news from trials and active refill businesses from the respective regions. Uh, before we proceed to this discussion, we request you all to please put in your uh, queries in the Q&A function and any comments, any uh, information or networking, you can use the chat function. Uh, this webinar will be recorded and will be uploaded on our website and our YouTube channel. We request you all to please use this platform to have a healthy and a very constructive dialogue and discussion to share maximum queries as, as possible for this panel. So back to the base dialogue and over to you, Emma. Thanks, Akanksha. Fantastic introduction and, and welcome to everybody. Um, we are and from all over the world, as usual, I try to make these panels as global as possible. Uh, so uh, myself and Catherine are in the UK. Well, Catherine, are you still in Paris? I'm not sure. No, no, you, I'm in the UK today. You're back. So Catherine's just hot-footed it back from uh, a refill and reuse conference in, in uh, France, which, which I'm sure she'll talk to us about. And Lakesh joining us from, uh, from India, from Bombay, if I'm right. Uh, so I really wanted to pull together the learnings from you guys and thank you for joining me on this panel. Um, I'm gonna dive straight in because we always find we don't have enough time for everyone's questions. So um, so if that's okay, can you can you give us a really short introduction to your work and, and can you give us your interpretation of, of reuse and refill? Lakesh, can I come to you first? Sure, firstly, uh, Emma Akanksha, thanks for having me over, uh, over here. Would love to have the discussion, really, really excited to understand what's actually happening on the other side of the world understanding and what we can learn and how we can grow together. So for everyone out here, my name is Loke Samwani. I'm 26 years old. I'm the co-founder of Capable and Refillable. Uh, we've been actively working on reusable and refillable packaging in India for the past five and a half odd years now. We've worked with the likes of Burger King, Taco Bell, AB InBev, uh, multiple different uh, international events like Lola Palooza, 
We work with artists like Ed Sheeran. We are now starting to work with the likes of Unilever, PNG, and even the Tata Group in India itself. All around the field of circular economy, our company is essentially based on three pr basic principles. What is taught to us in school: it's reduce, reuse, and recycle. Our aim is to reduce the non-renewable content in every packaging. So we literally redesign the packaging along with the supply chain heads of each department itself. We ensure the longevity of the packaging unit to increase the life cycle of it. And at the end of it, we even work with recycling partners all around to ensure that there are no kind of carbon emissions which are kept out there. So that's what we do in the gist. We have multiple different technologies what we're working on, but that's I'll keep something that for a later point. Yeah, please. That's brilliant. Fantastic. Over to you, Catherine. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for having me as well. It's really great to be here and also really interested to learn about what's happening in India and other markets. I think we can be very Eurocentric about uh, the reuse world. So I uh, run a consultancy called Go Unpackaged. Um, I have been working in this space for 17 years. So I set up the first modern zero waste store back in 2006. And ever since then, I've been trying to work out what the transition looks like from single use to reusable packaging. So we work across the three areas. So we develop solutions. We do consultancy for any client that wants to transition from single use to reuse. And then I work on policy as well. So how do we create the enabling conditions for reuse to thrive? So working with governments. Our biggest project at the minute is called the Refill Coalition. So we have redesigned the dispensers that you see in store where customers come and refill their uh, containers from and we've redesigned it so it's a bit like um, a beer keg or something you know something that's just a supply chain piece of packaging and it's standardized so it means it could be filled by Unilever and go out to Walmart and then go back and be filled by P&G and go out to another you know uh, massive supermarket and the idea is to create a system that everyone can use the same system across open source principles so that's the biggest project we're working on at the minute. Wow. Okay. So a couple of things came up there. Brilliant for me, Catherine. So creating these enabling conditions for refill to thrive. Uh, and, and you mentioned open source at the end. Um, I want us to sort of dip back into a bit of history here. So Lakesh and I were talking about refill in India and how uh, how, how that's changed uh, fairly rapidly. Um, maybe looking past, past the last decade, actually, Catherine, I know you've been working in this, as you said, since 2006, but going a little bit further... How has reuse and refill changed in each of your locations? Um, and, you know, what are you seeing, you know, uh, uh, currently uh, and how has it changed? Look, Ash, give us a little bit of history. Thanks for that, Emma. So uh, India is a quite different market, right? Uh, to, to take you all back close, let's say 30 years ago, that was the first time, I thought, 35 years ago, rather, that was the first time when... PET bottles, HDPE bottles. So for everyone, right? There are seven different types of plastic materials which are currently used widely. Uh, three of them are used in about 70% ratio in our country. That's PET bottles, that's HDP, and those are smaller sachets, uh, MLP sachets. For back uh -huh. All of these units were essentially introduced in the late 1980s or early 1990s in our country, primarily because we saw the supply chain was broken. Why was the supply chain broken? So any packaged good company at that moment was not labeling it at that moment. There were no brands. There were manufacturers, there were wholesalers, there were retailers who were giving it off to direct end users at that moment. Mm. Nothing was of a particular brand at that moment. So what the manufacturers essentially saw were two great opportunities. Mm. One opportunity came in as a problem because the end users started complaining about the quality of products. So they had to actually investigate and they found out that wholesalers and retailers were actually mixing water to dilute the material and they were affecting the entire product quality. So that's why manufacturers actually took upon themselves and thought, what if we can own the entire supply chain and get the retailer's margin as well? So that's the history of uh, 35 years ago. The packaging was a need, like a functional need. It wasn't a differentiator. It wasn't launched as a differentiator rather in today's world. It was launched to meet that functional demand itself. So that's the history of packaging. So yeah, I think that's so right? important to understand where we've come from, right? How we've ended up with this, yeah? Exactly right, exactly right. And till date, right, even 35 years later, uh, to all the people who are joining in from India, we have these local mom and pop stores. So if you're talking about groceries, right, if we don't opt 
for the certain kind of brands, we can actually walk up to the mom and pop store and still get refills. They're unbranded products, which they will literally weigh and give it to you. Of course, in today's world, we call it the unpackaged way or the, the reusable format, but it's been inherently being done over the last three to four decades in India regardless. And that culture is very strongly <laughs> present. Like I'll give you just one more example over here. We have a, we have the system of Dabbawalas. Uh, like usually your, everyone talks about the milkman model, exactly uh -huh. the same, but it's like a lunch or tiffin service. So because people used to go for uh -huh. work and they like to have hot foods, uh, hot food, Mumbai particularly has this Dabbawala system, which used to get, you bring your hot food to your doorstep, collect it back, clean it, again, refill the food the next day and give it back. And it's a very complex supply chain, which still services over millions of people or millions of office goers every single day. So inherently, India had always the reuse and refill needs. But unfortunately, in the last decade or so, thanks to technology, thanks to more capita per income, more premiumization, those trends are moving towards packaging because packaging is now no longer a differentiator. It, 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 it's perceived as a differentiator. What's It creates a story around it. It mm -hmm. creates a backstory of a particular brand. That's why we've started to see more and more packaging over through decades itself. And that's absolutely, uh, you know, I think that's so, so useful to just go back through that because so, so often we'll get into this. I'm sure we talk about the need for packaging, the functional need, the hygiene need, the barriers, the challenges, all those sort of things. And actually, we need to understand that some of this has been, you know, driven by different forces because then we need we know we know where to push. Right. So, uh, Catherine, in contrast, can you give us a sort of potted history of where we are? How did we get to where we are? Okay. Yeah. So we, um, so we, I mean, we have always had a very different food culture. Um, so I think where, if you look at the rise of single use packaging in the UK, it actually fits into a different uh, socio-cultural context. And it was actually more about um, convenience. And it really coincided with a lot of women going into the workplace instead of being at home. So this idea that you had traditionally a mum at home who was cooking all the food, the convenience model was really sold as part of that kind of um, sort of slightly feminist movement. Um, I'm, I'm not saying one led to the other, but they all happened at the same time where suddenly there was lots of things like packaged foods, white goods, you know, uh, washing machines that would wash things for you. So you could do other things with your time. And that coincided with this huge kind of cultural shift. At the same time, we don't have a really strong food market culture um, like you do in the sense of uh, lots of food being sold openly in markets loose. And a lot of that has to do with our weather as well, because we just can't produce half the food, you know, if we only ate what we produced, we'd just eat a lot of potatoes. So we have this huge importing culture of food as well. And I think we then also, as part of all of this mix, saw a huge rise in the supermarkets as yeah. well. So 98% of the UK population shops in supermarkets, not in independent stores. So then suddenly you've got supermarkets who are achieving uh, you know, massive economies of scale, driving down prices, uh, importing lots of food along supply chains. And all of those things lead to this sort of huge boom in, um, uh, in single use. We've obviously also got a huge petrochemical industry uh, who is very happy, you know, to be to be making money off single use plastics as well. So those that's sort of the history in terms of reuse and refill. I mean, I remember glass and milk bottles. So my grandmother used to get her milk delivered by a milkman to the door. There was a brand called Corona that had pop bottles. So, you know, um, soft drinks that had deposits on them. And then there was a what we used to call a pick and mix. So there was this chain called Woolworths where you used to go and fill up your own sweets when you were a child. Penny sweets. Those are probably the three main reuse and refill um, examples that we have historically here. So we just don't have that culture. So as you say, like when, when I set up my first shop, I never said that I invented some sort of culture of selling things loose. What I wanted to do was to link what I saw as the problem of packaging and the problem of the, you know, the environmental causes or the environmental um, pollution, degradation, waste of resources that was coming uh, from all of the single use packaging. And I just tried to link the two things together, which is 
if you don't want this single use packaging, you can bring your own containers and fill up from my store. I've got a choice. Yeah. Lights have just gone off. Maybe if I wave. <laughs> Thanks, Catherine. I, I mean, I can certainly that. remember. So I grew up getting deposits back on Iron Brew in Scotland, uh, working in pubs where, you know, the um, the mixers still, you know, came in, in, in bottles that went back. You know, it certainly doesn't seem like, like that long ago. You know, my first job was with the milkman. So, I mean, I'd have been, you know, what would I have done? So it, it, it doesn't seem that long ago. And there are still lots of remnants. You know, I was saying to Lakesh when we joined that I still shop in a greengrocer where, you know, most of the veg, apart from the soft, soft fruit, is is unpackaged. But that's because the supply chains are much shorter. You know, the greengrocer goes to the wholesaler, picks it up, end of. Um, so I think it's really good to to put that in context. And Catherine, you know, presumably the further you go into Europe, this changes as well. The weather gets a bit better. I know in France, for example, a lot of open markets, that sort of thing. And I know you work a lot in supermarkets um, or in that in that field, Catherine. So maybe maybe we could lean into that and sort of how, what successes are you having? What are you seeing that is starting to buck this trend? You know, what's working? So we're at a really interesting point where um, there was a huge flurry of activity. So back in 2018 was when the Blue Planet episode of uh, the David Attenborough Blue Not Planet. Ago. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> and we all still talk about that. It was an actual, oh, was a actual moment. moment, you know. So there had been lots and lots of, you know, NGOs and everybody working, trying to get people to care about this problem of packaging. And it took, you know, David Attenborough, who everyone sees as our national treasure, actually holding up a mirror and saying, guys, this is happening because of the way we live our lives and you need to do something about it. So I think that week in our, so I, at that point, I had concessions within uh, Planet Organic, which is just a chain of 12 uh, supermarkets in London. I think we saw our sales go up by 40% that week alone. So suddenly it became a thing and everyone had to start acting on it. I think the challenging thing has always been, it's a very anti-plastic message. And whilst I 100% believe that plastic as a material, when it, especially in single use packaging terms, is pernicious and hugely problematic in terms of end of life, I don't know if the anti-plastic message is actually helping us get to where we need to get to, which is a pro-reuse message. What we really need is an anti-single-use pro-reuse mm -hmm. message because we all know that plastic is going to play a role within a reuse economy because we cannot have reusables made of metal or glass or other things because they just won't have the life in them. So um, in terms of where we're at with the supermarkets, the last... I guess five, six years has seen this huge flurry of activity in terms of individual trials. Mm. And it's okay, you know, the activist in me would like to go from zero to 100% reuse within about five years, if that's okay. I know that things are too complicated and big to shift that quickly. So I'm not sure it could have happened any other way. We needed businesses to take matters into their own hands and to really try and do these trials. But the unintended consequence of that is the trials that they ran were not scalable and were not designed to be scalable because they were individualistic. So Coca-Cola did something, Unilever have done about 50, I think, you know, there's all, but they're all one brand, one retailer. So the problem is, is that they then use the kind of KPIs and metrics that anyone uses within the commercial world of profitability, operational success, things like that. Even so, to a certain extent, the environmental benefits, because in a tiny trial, you're never going to receive, you know, you're never going to get the environmental benefits you will get at scale. But I tried in those eras to get them to think about scale. And you just couldn't get people there mm -hmm. because they couldn't envisage a whole reuse economy. You know, as you say, like the Dabawala approach, like that's an entire network that covers, you know, entire cities with a completely functioning system. And it's really hard to get people from where we are now to where yeah. we need to be. So I understand why it happened. But the problem is now is everyone has lost faith or oh, there is a trend towards big retailers and brands losing faith in reuse and refill because they believe that the results that they have got from their trials show that it won't work. No and the reality is, is the trials needed to have been designed differently to mm. understand what could work at scale. And I think the only way to do that is to 
to get coalitions together, to get competitors to work together, you know, in the same way that the drug companies had to work together to develop vaccines during um, uh, COVID, the big problems of our time require competitors to work together. And actually, if we design it in the right way, it works for everybody because you get to share risk you get to share resources and you get to an answer faster than if you do it by yourself but mm -hmm. trying to get people into that way of thinking is really really challenging well, you're trying to shift the social norm you know what we've just talked about in the last 15 minutes is about how things used to be how things still are in lots of places and how things could be and and all none of those things have come around by accident right so they've all it's, come... it's, yeah it's the same as electric cars it's the same as it reminds energy, me of you know it's, the, it's yes. these big societal shifts we need mm, yeah. and they are very difficult and very complicated they don't come around the first you know like you say electric cars 20 years ago the leaf and the prius you know, but we needed these external factors. We needed the consumer pressure. We needed the infrastructure, et cetera, et cetera. So, so fascinating. That's brilliant. And and I'm just going to come on now to a poll to get the audience um, engaged. And actually, that's about what are the key ingredients. So, Akanksha, if you could pop up our first poll, please. I'm going to ask what are the key ingredients for a successful reuse or refill trial? So it says refill here, but if, you, if you're using the term reuse as well, they're all inter interlinked what are the key ingredients and Catherine I know we're reducing this down to a list here um so it'd be interesting to see in your experience what you've you know what comes out for you so let's just give people a chance to uh to fill this in brilliant thank you so convenience coming out on top I mean that's our that's the buzzword of what the last 30 years in sustainability. If it's not convenient, people won't do it. I'm not a hundred percent. Lots of things in my life aren't convenient, but I still have to do them. Right? Um, but I get it. I get that maybe there's something there about the, it being a social norm. Um, I always find it's funny when people say things have to be convenient. When you go, when you fly somewhere and go on a plane, it's the least convenient thing that you could ever do, right? People still do it. They still love doing it. So I don't know. I think it's a bit of a psychology piece, that one. Um, Education is coming out quite high. And then provision of containers and packaging, which I know you've done a lot of work on, both of you. Um, great. OK, so we'll leave it there. Can you see those results, Catherine and Lokesh? Yeah. OK, so Lokesh, any, any thoughts on that poll? Would you agree? A uh, hundred percent, right? Like, And uh, most of the reuse companies always kill me for saying this, but if I have to look at the decades to come, they're going to be very, very different from the decades which have essentially gone by. Okay, to give you an example why I say this and why convenience is a game changer is because right now we have quick commerce applications in India which are servicing about close to 20 million orders daily. So that what I'm trying to get at is that let's say if I want any particular product, anything under the roof, let's say if I want a detergent to if I want to eat something, it can be at my doorstep within 15 minutes. That's the kind of convenience which is not opted out anywhere else. They're like not possible. If you're getting that kind of delta, we need to go in that particular direction itself. So Catherine, right? Like reuse and refill has been the prodigal son for the longest of times. But unfortunately, it's never been able to scale because you rightly mentioned the pilots are not designed in that manner. Y'all very interestingly, y'all spoke about the EVs, right? Similarly, like when Tesla was launching and when multiple different EV industry was launching, the charging infrastructure was subsidized. There was a reason why people were investing in the infrastructure and eventually three years or five years later, the first EV vehicle could be sold because the infrastructure was ready. But that's not the case for reuse and refill. Brands want to instantly say that, hey, we want to transition into the packaging, but no one wants to hear, build the infrastructure. That's where Catherine and I actually come into, uh, come into the picture that we have to build it for them. The companies are not inherently going to move and say that, hey, they, here's what we want to try, try out. They want to see the infrastructure being laid out by people like, like the, the new upcoming startups for it to work out. So I absolutely agree that convenience is the biggest parameter because that's the way internet has made to things. And happily, like if I have to look at my own daily life, I cannot live without that convenience. It's made me much more productive in way, at, mm -hmm. of course, at certain costs. But to now we need to think on an average 30-year-old, 35-year-old, where do they shop? 
Where does it get to me? That's so, you're so right. You're so right. And the numbers you're talking about, I mean, how does that make you feel, Catherine? We're talking about 20 million orders in in India, you know, shipped <laughs> to the door. It's just, you know, they're just vast numbers. It sort of makes me think that in terms of impact, these are the markets that we really need to, you know, we really need to work work on. And uh, it could move really, really quick. What are your thoughts on, on the scale of things, Catherine? I'd love it if certain markets leapt frogged ours. You know, if you think of the example that everyone always gives about mobile phone technology in various African countries is a million times better than ours because loads of um, people just skipped the whole landline yeah, whole way of doing it. So, you know, if you think of the amount of people that kind of can do mobile banking and things in a way that, you know, older generations in struggling in different countries can't. So I, it would be great if the I guess a sort of gradual kind of middle classification of the world could avoid the mistakes that we're making with single-use packaging I don't know if given the um the control that a very small amount of FMCG companies have across a global market I don't know whether that's ever going to happen so Mm -hmm. I think three things I think well I think number one you talk about markets if we had a 30 percent reuse rate in the UK which is what the NGOs would dream of, right? right. Um, given that we, well, I used, I did this figure based on the 65, the 60 billion items of single use plastic packaging that are placed on the market in the UK. Now it's more like 90, but if you did it on the 30%, I think I worked out that's 365 million items of single use packaging that you need to sell and get back on a weekly basis to make that system work. So our market is way big enough for even us to like deal with here, right? So these are huge quantities. But I think in terms of the poll, I think three additional things in terms of the key ingredients. I think number one is a commercial model. So we have got an an, an analytical supply chain tool that measures the end-to-end activities and costs in any supply chain. So it meant it measures literally how long does it take for a forklift truck to pick a pallet from this side of a warehouse to the other side? How long does it take somebody within a retailer to open a box and put 12 bottles on a shelf? So every single activity in a, in a supply chain is measured and a cost is assigned to it. We can then compare that to uh, a, a reusable, a, you know, a, a, an actual or a fictional reusable system. And you suddenly start to see that there are very different cost benefits, uh, positive and negative, at different mm-hmm. points in the supply chain. So everyone says, well, reuse is going to be more expensive because you have a return leg, you've got to wash it, you've got to clean it. Okay, fine. So you might add some cost in there, but you suddenly find you've removed five pounds worth of packaging per case because you're not using the single use. So yes, you've got an investment in the original reusable packaging, but that becomes an asset whose cost is amortized over uses. So there are are ways of looking at the cost. And just as an example, the um, cereal that we're doing in our trial that you deliver in, in these bulk containers that are designed to be cubed out on a pallet load, you can deliver 70% more cereal in our bulk container per pallet than you can with cereal and single use packets. Mm. And that's because of the amount of air in every single yeah. So you suddenly go, oh wow, well we can get X percent. Yeah, mm. so X percent more product on a pallet means X percent less lorries on the road, X percent less fuel, X percent less um, carbon emissions. Mm. And that gives you the economic headroom to invest in the reusable packaging. So I think the commercial model is absolutely essential of what the reusable system would be at scale. So that's the first one. The second one is, I think, full cost accounting of single use. So we all know that the negative externalities of the impacts of the single use packaging are not baked into the cost of the system. Mm -hmm. So we need to compare, we need to be fair when we're comparing. Everyone expects reuse to be able to perform, but actually they're not taking into account, you know, we just shove it in our recycling or we export it to places that have even worse, you know, recycling infrastructure than we do. And that cost is ignored in terms of financial costs, resource costs, human health costs, uh, natural world degradation, things like that. So that's not a fair comparison. And then the third one is, is 
at a certain point, I think you just have to delist the single use alternative. So we talk about convenience. It would become a lot more convenient if you couldn't buy the thing that you wanted in single use. And I think a really good example of that is that in Europe, there are starting to be various bans um, mm. on a take away, a single use packaging when you dine in in a restaurant. And I think what we need is a global movement to expand that to any form of closed loop environment. Yeah. You are in a school, an office, a festival, an mm. event, venue, yeah. Disney World, venues. You know, if you go to a concert, you're not buying a beer so you can take it home with you. You're not even allowed to take it out of the, the venue, right? So any of those closed loop environments should have 100% reusables because then the system would start to work because you'd have scale. Mm. Everyone could use, all the, the vendors could use a shared system. So, yeah, I think we're going to have to get a bit more... Um, directional about what single use you can buy yeah no I completely agree and I, I, I'm with you here and I think this is where this word convenience sort of bristles me a bit because it's like you know yes we know it's very convenient to buy you know plastic wipes and flush them down the toilet but then look at all the problem we've got and all the external costs and you know all that comes back on the taxpayer etc well et exactly the cost to government you know yeah, there's that, that's which you know better than I do, but at the minute, I think business pays 10% towards the cost of waste management in the UK. Um, and we as householders pay the other 90%. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, in that way, you're just privatising the profits on packaging and socialising the costs. And we all know yeah. that no government anywhere in the world has any money to do the things it really needs to do, let alone subsidise. No, no, no. We're fighting a losing off. battle when it comes to these you know, single use items. And Lakesh, okay, so I'll come back to you on these uh, on the multi-layer packaging. So I know you want to talk about that. But Kate says in the chat, uh, shared asset stroke inventory model is absolutely key so that we share this reusable container. So I loved your idea of the, the keg idea, you know, the, I mean, breweries, you know, beer goes back and forward in, in kegs anyway, doesn't it? But that's not across brands, is it? That's within, within brands. Uh, no, but no, it, no, 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 they're, they're standardized. Yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. I mean, you might get a really big, um, so it's, it's the same with pallets. You know, yes, there is a client yeah. that works reusable pallets, our, our partner Chet does them. Now, if you're a big enough business, you might buy and own your pallets, but they're the same pallets as would be in a shared system and everyone else is just sharing them. Yeah, absolutely. So I've got my Packerang bag here on my desk. I show people it's reusable packaging. So shared system that can go anywhere in the world and just go round and round and round and round and round. Okay, and you can, obviously you can brand it if you wanted to. But um, but yeah, the, so the, I guess what I'm going to is we, we've got these solutions. And I think what I'm hearing, Catherine, is that we just need scale. We need to pull the levers or or put the gears in place to um, to to you know, pull the levers. Kate's come back with some municip municipalities in Canada are now imposing bans on single use items, not single use plastics. So that's great to hear. Brilliant. Okay, so I'm going to come to a couple of questions from the audience now. Um, and this is going to come up. Okay, we're, we're halfway through the webinar, but I knew it would come up. How can we address concerns about the cleanliness of reuse? In this case, uh, Sahib's asked about refillable beverage systems, and the but the perceived contamination of everyday products. Um, thoughts on that? Now I worked through COVID. On on I know you and I, Catherine, sat on the same sort of group trying to uh, counter some of these um, perceptions and actually messages that are wrongly put out around hygiene. Um, Lokesh, you said something you're coming across in India. Is is the hygiene argument put in place as a barrier? Yes, it was. So immediately during COVID, right, it became a very big barrier to most of our customers. Uh, so I'll give an example. We're working with a cinema at the moment, right? Uh, we're helping the cinema transition from single-use packaging to reusable packaging entirely. The biggest question, the supply chain manager asked us that, how can you promise the hygiene parameters consistently? And especially during COVID, because everyone was at risk at that point of time. The solution to it was transparency. Like yep. uh, hygiene level, quality level, all kind of standardization. So number one, right? The first thing foremost, what you need to do is get your reuse center, wherever you're getting the washing center done, is to get it certified and ensure that you are using the right techniques to wash it, number one. Number two is integrated with the tech system. Because at the end of the day, the mm. deep down, the person wants to know at what point of time has it been washed? Where has it been washed? When was it collected? If you can actually provide that data, 
to the end customer. The end customer it does not care about. Believe me, the end customer does not care about it. 95% of the time, they don't even scan the code to check it. The person who scans the code is the buyer, is the procurement yeah. manager, the supply chain manager, because they want to check insurance. It. Yeah, Ex exactly. So they are looking for a seal of in assurance from asset, and that's about it. Because I personally believe, right, inherently, reuse systems, the kind of washing what we are doing is much better than the kind of washing what hotels or other industries have even seen for that matter of fact. We are doing it in a much, much more effective manner with a better cost structure. So that's my take on contamination and hygiene. It's a very easily solvable problem if you are just transparent with the other person. I absolutely agree. I'm working with a, um, a company that works on reusable textiles in hospitals. OK, um, and so, you know, hygiene is absolutely paramount, but you're you're spot on, Lakesh. The, 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 the decontamination or the laundry or the whatever you need to do can all be standardized, can all be tracked. The difference is if you're buying products in from who knows where and we, we all know in the UK, we've had a PPE scandal. You know, actually, that's not transparent as to where that product has come through from, the stages it's been through, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a, it's an almost, um, it's an ironic argument people use when they say to me, oh, I won't reuse a spoon because I don't know if it's clean. And I'm like, well, you don't know how long that plastic spoon has been sat on that, in that tub, you know, and how much, yeah. So you, you don't have any clarity over that. So I think, I think you, you've, you've put that across really well, Lokesh, you know, how we need to be, uh, linking with technology, providing the transparency, and actually that problem kind of goes away. Catherine, any any insights from your work on that side of things? No, I just think I agree with you, um, Lokesh. I, I sit on so many round tables where everybody goes, oh, there's no washing stands. I'm like, there's a whole load of ISO washing standards that yeah. exist. You know, when you walk into a restaurant, you do not immediately say, have you washed this knife correctly? You know? There are we we're managing to like reuse things in hospitals, hospital bed sheets. I mean, we're not killing people every day. You know, there's a load of standards that exist already in normal world, and then there's a load of people working on reuse standards like the PR three people and things. So mm. none of it is no. surmountable. You do just have to work through it. So we mm. have a new washing plant for our vessels that go around the refill coalition system, and yeah, we've had to go through like two or three rounds of wash validation. Uh, to make sure allergens are properly managed you know plastic is difficult to wash it's really difficult to wash and it's really difficult to dry in any way that's mm -hmm. um, environmentally sound because you've got to make sure that all of the moisture's come out of it before you cap the vessel and then it goes back to the supplier so yeah we've had to go through a load of them but every company we work with the retailers you know they've all got a compliance manager and the compliance manager comes with their list of things that they need to see yeah. and the plant you know either buys new equipment inv invests in a new process and proves it through multiple testing that they've achieved it and then we've got microbiological testing and things like that so yeah so it doesn't yeah none of them are insurmountable and I do think it is an excuse that is given for not taking action rather than anything that I have yet to see be a problem yeah great well that's that's great insight Catherine that's exactly my um my understanding well as well sometimes new standards do need to be produced you know that's because some industries have grown up in a single use way and they don't have that you know reuse but in lots of industries I often say to people when every time you go to a hotel you put your head on a pillow that's been reused by probably hundreds if not thousands of people you know you trust the hotel has laundered it properly I can't see the difference great question thank you um, not to focus on the barriers, but I feel like, you know, these are the questions that are coming in. I think we should we should clear them up. The other one here is about um, from Vanessa. Can we address okay. concerns about loss of product or theft? Um, so, you know, more expensive products. If you're choosing, I don't know, uh, nuts, for example, versus something like oats. Catherine, is that something you've come across in your trials? In the UK, much less so. Now, I, I hate to point fingers at other countries, but having just been in France, there is a huge problem with fraud in France. Ooh. And we have been trying to understand why. And I genuinely think that there is a, a cultural approach in France that is about sort of sticking it to the man, that it's not really stealing because it's coming from a big company. And you see that in terms of like people sharing tickets on the Metro and stuff like that. So. It, it reminded me that there is a very different oh. cultural approach to things in different countries. So we have technology called eSense, which is run by DigiGroup um, on the vessel, on the dispensers. So when, if there were two of us filling up something, 
uh, the e sense talks to the scale, and the only picture that comes up of the product is the one I've taken, the ones you've taken. Now right. it's not foolproof because you there's always a search. You always have to have a search function for someone to search for products they can't. So you could go through a lot of steps, but we prefer to use kind of nudges like that. Mm. There's a lot of so my colleague Helen does all our behavior change work. There's a lot of ways that you can. Um, uh, instigate behavior change by showing that other people do it you know yeah. it's the same thing as that you get in the hotels and things when they say 80 percent of our customers don't need their towels washed every day and you basically are telling people that everyone else is doing it so you need to do it yeah, the same thing. yeah just make it normal you can put cameras on things. So in the UK, we've had a massive shift in supermarkets to self-service checkout. So you don't go and check out with a human, you just scan your own barcodes. A lot of those have cameras on them now. So you see your face. Loads of those cameras aren't linked to anything, but mm -hmm. um, behavior change research would show you that if you believe you're being filmed, you yeah, will behave yeah. better than if you're not. So oh, yes, it is there. Um, it is, it's no more or no greater than what's going on at self-service checkout. So if you ask the, I think if you ask UK retailers, they sell more carrots than are in actual supply. There's, there's like more carrots sold through retailers than you could even ever produce because so many people put expensive things through as carrots. Oh, well, I've never heard that story. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Brilliant. Brilliant. Guy, the first time I've ever seen it I was in one and there was a guy in a suit next to me and I literally watched him put every single thing through as like one label and I was just fascinated I was like what are you doing like but people do it in my brain and it's, yeah. and, it's made, and it's mainly not the people who need the food so it, it sounds like it, it kind of is an issue but again Catherine not insurmountable Lakesh did you want to add anything to that on the on the loss of products is that something you're working on so I agree with Catherine on this, that it's very behavioral based, based on your geography, right? Uh, let's say in India, we follow for each different region, we follow either a stick method or a rewarding method. You need to understand that how do you incentivize to either refill or return the container so that there is no loss at any point of time. It may be a monetary discount. It may be giving them bragging rights for a particular packaging, make them feel like they've done such a great job. But you need to understand what's the hook what is really important for your user and that differs from a geography to geography based. So there is no one way to answer this particular question how do we solve for the theft problem because it's, go it's going to be very locally sourced. But yes, it is very much solvable because the assumption is that everyone ha or every reuse company on the planet has a technology which can actually trace back where the unit is. Once you can trace back where it is, now it's a problem that why isn't the person returning it back? Why are they actually storing it with them? Once you understand why are they storing it with them, you can solve that particular problem. And I feel it's on the core human motivation itself. Yeah, so a lot of behavior there, a lot of behavioral insights being really important. And again, maybe we just didn't fully um, take that into account with some of the sort of earlier trials and that sort of thing. We're just assuming, I mean, I know, Catherine, some of the trials that, that you've been involved in that I've seen, you know, they're sort of hard to see and you don't quite know what you're doing. And, you know, they, they weren't maybe in the right place in the store. So we didn't really funnel into some of those behavioral, you know, aspects, whereas other trials have been a great success because they're, you know, front and center, they're easy to use, people get education, get someone to help, all those sorts of things. So there's a lot, you know, a lot that has to go into this. But we, 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 we've we touched on cost sort of right at the beginning. And I wanted to come back to um, a, a question here uh, from Amberly. Based on your experience, how ready, do you, how ready do you think industry is to finance reuse? Um, they've mentioned EPR as a potential method um, or a global plastics treaty. I know both of those things are massive topics. Um, but yeah, best, best, basic back to that question. How ready do you think industry is? Catherine, you're, you're hot back from a trade fair. So mm -hmm. what was that telling um, you? I think, what do I think? I think it's going to have to be a combination. I don't believe that um, government should be financing private companies uh, to do all the work. But I do recognise that any additional cost will probably be justified by the companies being passed on to the consumer, and that's not fair in itself. I think I think we subsidise a lot of things. So I've really been thinking, especially this week, about how much the fact that we 
massively subsidized fossil fuels mm. how much of that subsidy plays into the cheapness of plastics which is a direct result right so we subsidize fossil fuels we subsidize amazon to build a distribution center so we could quite easily be subsidizing green transition green economy activities the government could be subsidizing the um, building of a washing plant in a post-industrial area where they needed jobs and things like that. So I think if we could turn people, we need to turn a lot of parts, both of the supply chain and of government policy and government subsidies all in the same direction. Mm. So I think that's what we're lacking at the minute is a sort of vision that everyone can work towards. And I do think that we need to tax single use appropriately for the problems it causes through EPR, I just think we need more EPR, so extended producer responsibility. And I think we should be actively ring fencing monies from EPR to invest in reuse infrastructure. Good. Yeah. So actually directing some of those monies to the to the uh, the hotspots, if you like, that, that need them. I think you're right, Catherine, in my experience, the industry talking about EPR are saying that that would be borne by the consumer. Um, there are also um, not so much in, in food, but in some cases there's VAT, VAT on top of that. So we need to look at measures like how we take tax off, off um, you know, elements like reuse, trying to incentivize it. Um, Lokesh, in India, what do you feel about that system? How ready is industry to pay for it? And, and what's your sort of equivalent conversation around extended producer responsibility? So uh, it's funny that you mentioned that because in India, right, uh, in EPR itself, the government mandated brands to reuse their packaging up to the level of 70%. But brands just lobbied it and pushed it even further to two years. Now it's going to happen for additional two years itself, right? So wow. the reason why that's essentially happening is because the government or rather brands, the entire industry is not ready to invest in the infrastructure yet. So I, I, the way I think about the entire problem statement is reuse supply chain is different from a single-use supply chain. Mm. Folks at the right industry, at the, from an industry level point of view, do not want to make that switch because they are used to the convenient single-use supply chain manner. In a reuse, you have a layer where you need to ensure it gets collected, it gets clean, again, sent back to the manufacturing unit. Or the single-use, very simple. I place an order, I get the packaging units delivered at my particular doorstep. The number of stakeholders are much lesser. So that's why there is no company who is ready to invest in a reusable infrastructure, but because they actually don't want to go for it. They would much rather lobby it and push it for a new mm -hmm. material to come in. They would much happily pay a 20% premium in a biodegradable packaging to come in of the single-use nature rather than focusing on a reuse model because it is just different. And yeah. historically, like look at it from a century point of view. How many new materials have we actually discovered? Plastic is the only material which we actually came across. The scientists have been pouring in so much amount of money. It's high time we realize that reuse is not just the prodigal son, but it's actually the solution of the future. So that's yeah. where the broken part is. Absolutely. I want, I'm going to come back to that for the, to finish up the webinar. It's absolutely, uh, you're absolutely right. We do, we spend a lot of, when people say there's no money, we spend a ridiculous amount of money on R&D. We're seeing this whole plethora at the moment of different packaging formats. Um, Catherine started today talking about, you know, the the, the plastic, uh, the blue planet, the impact that that's had. And now we're seeing paper wine bottles and all sorts of, you know, things which are costing millions in R&D, millions. So so I, of my opinion, there is the money. It's just a case of where you want to spend it. Uh, and I think, I think you're both in agreement there. Um, I, we're really close to, uh, to, to wrapping up and I just want to come to a couple of really quick questions for you. And I, I'm, I'm interested in impact. Uh, so, so how do we measure that? What are the most valuable metrics? If someone was to say to you, how do you know, Lokesh, that you're having success? How do you measure your success? So number one, right? For anyone in the reuse and refill industry, this needs to be benchmarked uh, primarily for everybody. That's number one. You create an impact analysis of your packaging in the first place. Get it verified that how many emissions does it take to manufacture that kind of product. Then evaluate versus if it's being used one time, if it's being used five times, if it's being used five, 500 times. 
then you compare the number of net emissions per use and yeah. make a comparison with single use. So essentially, I'm not saying that, hey, I'm going to be using, let's say a lot of companies say that, hey, we are moving from single use plastic to aluminum containers. Great, great, great job. But how many times are you reusing it? Yeah. No, not a lot of people would know, but a single use plastic hypothetically would be taking, let's say one kilogram uh, of carbon emissions versus an aluminum would take in that ratio itself would be take about six kilograms. Yeah. So if you do not, that what I'm trying to say, what if we do not reuse at least six to seven times on a net basis, that means you emitted more. So for any reuse and refill company, the primary thing to track is the number of carbon emission, number of reuse cycles for us. That's what we essentially track, then combine it. Of course, uh, our logistics are like a scope three bit that how many number of times can you collect? How densely can you collect the packaging units together? So really am, I, am I traveling five kilometers to collect one packaging unit or am I collecting 50 packaging units by, just by traveling a kilometer? So how densely can you map the reverse logistics bit is very, very crucial for us to actually create a final impact. So these mm -hmm. are the three primary modes, I would say is something which is very, very important for us to look out. I really like that. And I really like that different lens as well, that lens of density, you know, the lens of carbon. It makes so much more sense. Uh, you know, we've, we've been talking a lot about tons of waste for years and years, in particularly in, in policy and regulations. And actually, now we need to very quickly integrate the carbon message um, or the carbon metrics, sorry. And Lokesh, you made the really good point there that just moving from one single use, uh, you know, format to another single use format that does not, you know, usually in almost all cases, does very little to help the carbon footprint. Catherine, similar for you or, or what are your key metrics that you're working on? I think similar, but we um, probably widen it out to sort of full a full life cycle analysis because um, then we can bring in kind of water usage and things like that, which is, you know, becomes a bigger water problem water. in various different cultures um, and areas and, and parts of the world. So we have done, yeah, comparisons of our vessel against um, against the single use alternative across the different uh, LCA metrics to try and ensure that we're on track. But whilst also appreciating that at uh, trial level, you're never going to. So we try and measure it as what happens at scale. I think the important thing to remember is, is that the commercials tend to mirror the environmental aspect. So it would not be commercially viable for you, you know, your density question. There's no point you driving five kilometers to pick up one pack. It doesn't make any sense. You have to pick up 50 packs within, you know, 0.1 kilometer. So that's actually a sort of something that's very useful for us because mm -hmm. the businesses care about proving their environmental credentials, but they also need to prove the kind of um, um, commercial and operational uh, benefits of the system as well. So I guess we look at kind of commercial benefits, operational benefits, consumer uh, benefits or KPIs rather, um, and then sustainability metrics. So we kind of go across all those four in terms of whether a solution is working. Great. And are either of you, are you waiting for the policy or are you working uh, almost, you know, you don't need the policy, you're just going to crack on? I mean, is it is the policy pivotal to you, Catherine? Are you sort of waiting for this policy tipping point or? I was until about yesterday, until I <laughs> suddenly realised that the policy is not going to save us. So the, the problem is, is if you think about the sort of, well, being in the UK, the three levels we've got is we've got the Global Treaty on Plastics, we've got the PPWR, so the Packaging and Packaging Waste Directive in Europe, even though because of Brexit, we're not technically part of Europe, but they are our biggest trading partners. So we tend to align with a lot of regulation because we have to. Um, and then what happens in the UK? Now, I think most of the world is looking at the PPWR as the most progressive le progressive legislation on reuse and refill. But the problem is, is that we have a huge missed opportunity for most of the FMCG products because they've really, because of the lobbying that went on on behalf of the single use packaging industry and the food to go industry. Um, it's been watered down so much that really we're just looking at transit packaging, beverage packaging and takeaway packaging. And there's some fairly weak targets in there for that. So really, those three areas do not cover the majority of products in a consumer's basket when they go around a supermarket. The global treaty, I don't know if we're going to get anything at Target. We'll probably get, you know, warm words. Shall endeavour to instead of must, you know, mm -hmm. that's not an obligation. 
um, because industry is very successfully lobbied against it. Um, mm. So it sort of occurred to me in this trade fair yesterday is, wow, I just don't, I don't, I think we have missed our short term policy opportunity to do mm. anything meaningful. And we are going to have to find other ways of doing it, which means incentivizing business and making business yeah. understand that they need to do so. it. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I think so. I think I you're think right. That, yeah, I think maybe that should be me saying policy on targets, because I firmly believe that targets are what we need to change things. I think there is still opportunity for policy within EPR, within uh, DRS, so deposit return schemes that are, are taking on in Europe. Um, I think we can feed reuse through that. But yeah, I'm sort of not holding out um, hope. Yeah. And I absolutely hope you don't. I mean, Lakesh, just quickly before we wrap up, you know, are you waiting for the policy or like Catherine, are you, are you doing this despite of the policy not being there? Uh, believe me, right? Any, any company in the world would say that we want policy to come in today. <laughs> Unfortunately, that's not not necessarily the case. So we cannot wait for the policy just to kick in. We need to keep understanding what's important for the brand, what's important for the user, and keep innovating on that sense. That's those are my two cents very simply. Because policy will come when it has to. We can't really push our way through. We are. We can of course lobby it. We can of course reach the right folks. But that's only is something what we can do. Rather find a business model which actually affects the consumer and the brand. Understand what works and go and scale that up. Absolutely. Show how it's done, I think, is the is the way forward. And, you know, thank you for that. That, that hour has gone so fast. It's been absolutely fascinating. Um, we had a load of other questions that we didn't get to, but that, that was absolutely brilliant. I hope the audience have enjoyed that. We've answered a few a few questions. Um, just to summarise up in a few words, you know, Catherine, if you had a magic wand, what would you like to see? I'd like to see large scale coalitions of businesses working together uh, to create standardized solutions for their particular products, product categories, sectors. Brilliant. Love it. Lakesh, magic wand. Simple, simply put, right? Redesign the waste laws everywhere. So how we are any which we're segregating dry waste, wet waste, have a reuse waste as well. Everything gets collected, goes to the local material recovery facility gets segregated, gets washed, goes back to the manufacturer. It's as simple as that. Mm, and creates a whole new industry by the sounds of it. Right? Yeah, yeah. So there's the jobs that we wanted. Great. <laughs> so um, I'm going to finish up there. It's been an absolute pleasure. I could stay on for another hour at least. Uh, so thank you to everybody and thank you to our audience. Um, as I'm sure you've read in the chat, the um, Akanksha will put up the recording. Over to you, Akanksha, to wrap up. Thanks. Sure. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much for taking time out. And um, especially the panel, uh, you know, we've been able to capture such interesting opinions and voices, uh, both from India and from UK and understand how uh, refill has so much scope to become a circular business model. So thank you so much for uh, taking time out and be part of this discussion. And we are able to glad, uh, we are very glad that we're able to also capture a lot of uh, interesting, enthusiastic participation from the audience as well. So thank you again to the audience. Um, as I mentioned, this webinar is being recorded and will be available uh, on our uh, Be Waste Wise uh, platform, YouTube channel, and on our website. If you'd like to stay updated about future events, and then do please subscribe to our newsletter and follow us on social media. Thank you so much again, Emma. And thank, thank you, everyone. everyone. I'm out. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.